like recording is in progress. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad to see that we've got a good uh, good list of folks that are attending. Um, welcome to our uh, first meeting, our virtual meeting for the non-FEMA flood risk area initiative that uh, we've been working on for several years here at the city in stormwater management. Uh, my name is Claire Davis. I'm the floodplain administrator for the city. And uh, I've been the technical lead on this uh, project, and Jennifer has been the, the overall policy lead. And between the two of us, we've had a, a whole lot of involvement in this pro prog program and project for several years now. Um, we've got a virtual meeting format, so there's, uh, I guess there's a way we're trying to manage uh, getting as much input from folks as we can. Um, you can see on the little black bar across the bottom here that uh, I've got uh, kind of the raise your hand symbol. Uh, circled here in red. Um, whenever you want to make a comment, please uh, click that and that will uh, alert us that you've got a question for us. And then uh, if you've got other questions, you can put them in the chat over here. Um, again, during the presentation, everybody else is going to be muted. Um, we'll answer questions at the end of the meeting. And again, if you have a question, please post it in the chat um, so we can make sure that we're recording those questions and can get an answer to you. And then uh, this uh, presentation is being recorded. so. Uh, Thanks for being here to participate and looking forward to uh, seeing the questions we get. And my, there we go. So uh, for an agenda today, we've got uh, a look at some of the historic flooding in Fort Worth, kind of a brief overview of the stormwater uh, program primary functions. Um, and then we're going to dig into the two types of flooding that we see routinely uh, in the city um, and the, uh, the FEMA floodplains that everybody's familiar with. And then the focus of this presentation, the non-FEMA flood risk areas. Um, we'll also talk about where to find the information that we're talking about here. So if we've made a lot of this information newly available to the public, uh, take a look at what our next steps are, and then uh, take a look at some website demos for the information uh, locations that we talked about. And then we'll uh, dig into the questions as we go. <clears throat> so. Fort Worth is not a stranger to flooding. Um, we've got some photos here of some some historic flooding. These are, by and large, going to be the, the FEMA type of flooding on the large rivers um, on the top, the Trinity River from 1922, uh, Marine Creek and the Stockyards, 1938. Uh, again, Marine Creek in 1942 is a big flood. And then uh, the, essentially the flood of record for the city of Fort Worth is May 17th, 1949. Um, that's the one that flooded uh, inside the levees because the levees breached um, and then flooded the uh, Montgomery Wards building up to the second floor. So that's kind of our our biggest flood that we're aware of um, experiencing since we've been a city and uh, definitely one of the areas uh, types of flooding that we're working really hard with the Tarrant Regional Water District and the Corps of Engineers to prevent further damages like those. Uh, but we're also seeing flooding that happens not in the typical FEMA floodplains and that's kind of what will be the, the focus of this meeting. Um, big picture of the stormwater uh, Division's mission statement is to protect people and property from harmful stormwater runoff. I've got a couple uh, examples here. On the left is a, a FEMA type floodplain uh, that has overtopped the road and caused a real hazardous situation there. Um, you know, vehicles can get swept off the road if the flooding is deep enough. So um, those, uh, those are a type of flood risk that we're trying to be wary of. And then on the right is, is a situation more indicative of the non FEMA floodplain that we've been talking about. Um, this is uh, in a neighborhood kind of south of the TCU area, and uh, for all intents and purposes, it looks just like a floodplain. Uh, it just doesn't happen to be on a map. For primary functions of the utility, uh, we have really four main ones that we work on. Uh, we maintain, maintain our infrastructure, which consists of pipes, channels, those kind of things. Uh, we mitigate hazards, including flooding and erosion. Uh, we warn about the hazards, also for flooding and erosion. And then we review development uh, so that it complies with city standards for drainage and uh, those kinds of things. And uh, I got some photos of the types of things that we're talking about here. Uh, the maintenance side has some of our uh, debris removal trucks. Uh, we've got a detention pond in the, in the center bottom, uh, our stormwater criteria manual on the right, and then part of our flood warning system on the top right. When it gets into the flood types of flood risk we're talking about, again, on the FEMA floodplains on the left. Um, Trinity Boulevard and Precinct Line. Uh, that's uh, one of the larger streams that actually flows out of uh, Hearst and uh, Richland Hills, North Richland Hills area. Um, 
crosses down through Fort Worth and then uh, crosses over the top of uh, Trinity Boulevard. And you, we've got some warning, uh, warning infrastructure out there, uh, but uh, you can see that somebody has still managed to drive off into that. But that is one of the larger FEMA type floodplains that, uh, that we deal with on a routine basis. Um, on the right is another example of the non-FEMA or the non-mapped uh, floodplains that are out there. And uh, these are important for us because we have really more reports of flooding outside of the FEMA floodplains than inside. Uh, we've got more flood insurance policies and claims are also outside the FEMA floodplains. And frequently we're finding that the flood risk uh, from these non-FEMA floodplains is uh, too extensive to mitigate through capital projects in an easy kind of, easy kind of way. And the table here shows the, the numbers of policies that we have in the city. Um, as the floodplain administrator, I track uh, different types of uh, flood insurance claims and, lo and policy locations. So that helps us plan and understand kind of where flood risk is. And from a policy perspective, you can see that there's like twice as many uh, policies outside the floodplain is in. Um, those that have one claim, uh, again, there's uh, almost twice or a little over twice. And then for areas that have two or more claims, it's four times as many. It's outside than inside the floodplain. So these are serious indicators that we've got a, a significant flooding problem outside the FEMA floodplain that's been mapped by FEMA. So what's the difference between the two? Um, I guess I just, I guess a reminder on, I did hear a question coming in there. Um, if you'll throw that question into the chat, we'll, we'll be sure to grab that for you and then uh, make sure that we're answering that as we go along. Um, we're not the only folks that have been dealing with and, and looking into flooding outside the FEMA floodplain. Um, in 2018 and 2019, there were three large uh, reports that were issued by national type uh, associations um, that looked into urban flooding or non-FEMA flooding. It seems like urban flooding is kind of the, the, the name that most of those uh, organizations chose to represent that type of flooding. Um, we've got the uh, Texas and Galveston and University Park uh, on the left, urban flooding threat and the national challenge. And then the, in the center is the ASFPM Foundation. That's the Association of State Floodplain Managers. Um, they had a big report that they put together and provided to Washington. And then uh, on the right is uh, the challenge of urban flooding in the United States. Uh, and that's just an example of those types of reports that were prepared in the same timeline that we were starting to dig into the same issue. So we were also lucky to be involved in those uh, reports as well. Uh, FEMA also recognizes that there's a, a problem that exists outside the FEMA floodplains that have been mapped on the paper maps for years and years. Um, they've created this new tool called the Estimated Base Flood Elevation Viewer. Um, it uses the, a similar kind of uh, technology to understand the flood risks, risks that are outside the FEMA floodplains on the paper maps uh, for areas that are not mapped. And that's really helpful for uh, cities and communities that are trying to deal with development coming into these areas uh, to help prevent those areas from being flooded or damaged uh, as a result of uh, flood type events. But uh, without some sort of mapping, know where the floodplain is, uh, those, those developments could happen in a place that was really um, at risk of flooding. So this is a very helpful tool that FEMA came up with. Um, other cities in our area include the city of Dallas that has a similar mapping product uh, that they use to uh, understand flooding that's going on outside their floodplain maps. Uh, the green on this one is the Mills Creek drainage basin, and then the kind of the orangey yellow is the Peaks Branch, uh, two different basins, but they're nearby uh, within the city of Dallas. And they also use this information to help uh, scope uh, different capital projects for different parts of town. And then finally, the city of Grand Prairie um, has citywide drainage master plans that they have prepared to show the same kind of flooding that's going on outside the FEMA floodplains. And um, I used to work for the city of Grand Prairie, and I know that it's, it's very flat in, in a large part of that city. Um, and so you end up getting a lot of this kind of widespread, real shallow flooding, like you can see on this map here. There's, there's the deepest spots are actually in the streets where they're you know, some sort of conveyance system. But uh, they do have this uh, type of product for their whole city. Then uh, again, for us, we've been really working very hard with a variety of stakeholders. Uh, since 2018, we, we really kicked off this project and uh, we really put together a pretty robust stakeholder group. We had a bunch of residents, uh, developers, property owners, uh, engineering firms and insurance companies. 
title insurance lawyers and commercial and residential lenders and surveyors all helped to understand what that risk looked like. Um, we also worked with different groups like the Tarrant Appraisal District, uh, the Association of Realtors, uh, Real Estate Council, the Builders Association, Development Advisory Committee, City Council, Planning and Zoning Commissions, and then other city departments who would have a stake in trying to understand this type of risk. Uh, when it comes to really looking into what our, our projects or this project was going to try to provide, the, the three main things that we came up with were there were some concerns about uh, how we were dealing with this information or how we wanted to deal with the information. Um, from a big picture perspective, we wanted to be able to provide some maps to show where the, the, the flood zones were located um, and then uh, also communicate the risk and then regulate the risk ultimately. And then as part of those discussions, we came up with what were the biggest concerns that these individual stakeholders had. Um, on the mapping side, the biggest deal was, um, let's call it something other than a floodplain. Um, when people talk about floodplains, when they, people hear floodplains, they think about FEMA and then the potential insurance requirements, those kinds of things. Um, that was a, a significant hurdle. We wanted to make sure that we, we cleared on that. Um, we also wanted to make sure that there were, we were clear about our maps not being a requirement for flood insurance. Um, that's, that's sort of an interesting topic because, you know, a lender can require flood insurance at any time. Uh, it's up to them to require that, uh, except when they're, when there's a property in the floodplain. And that's, that's the only time that it's mandatory. If it's in a FEMA floodplain, then, uh, you know, the, the flood insurance is required for any kind of property that has a, a federally backed mortgage. Um, and at the end of the day, we, on the mapping side, we, uh, came to learn that as people become aware of the, uh, the flood risk and as people become aware of, you know, how to find this information, uh, there would be less confusion about how these maps were shown and less uh, real concerns about um, how this, this type of mapping could influence real estate transactions. On the communication side, um, th the main question was how will, uh, how will this, impact property values. Well, there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of information that goes on with property values and flooding. Um, you know, if you're a resident of Houston or Austin, you know that, that flooding is, is kind of a frequent occurrence in those areas. And so it doesn't have a big influence on property values there. Um, we also found here dealing with our own, our own situations that there's a wide variety of factors that go into property values. Um, the biggest one that we found was that, you know, evidence of actual flooding was the thing that really affected property values most. It wasn't so much the way that this, uh, these flood areas were being communicated or mapped that was going to really affect property values. And then finally, um, on the regulatory side, if we, if we want to do something that helps uh, prevent future damages uh, by either new developments or redevelopments in these uh, potential flood prone areas, what, what does this what do those recommend? What do those regulations or potential regulations do to uh, impede development? And realistically, this is a new policy that is only going to apply to those developments that are one acre in size or less. Already, uh, any kind of development that's one acre or larger uh, already goes through a, a fairly rigorous uh, city review process for stormwater management. Um, there's there's kind of this loophole that exists for those properties that are less or projects that are less than an acre. And what we wanted to do is, is try to provide some sort of notice to those property owners and, and developers so that as they came in with their smaller project, they were made aware of these types of risks and could then deal with the risk uh, as part of their project planning. And to really do that, we're, we're looking to have some sort of a, a compliance uh, certification to, to show that they've been made aware of it and that they're dealing with the risk appropriately. And that the kind of the biggest perk here for us is that you know, all of this is going to be managed at the local level. There's not going to be any sort of FEMA issue. Um, we feel like that's going to be the way that would be most flexible uh, for those kinds of situations. What's going on here? Oops. Oh, I guess there's another thing here. Um, we dug into the potential impacts on building permits uh, that would that would be affected by 
uh, any of these uh, concerns. And what we found is that between May of 2021 and May of 2022, only 12 commercial permits and 20 residential permits would have been affected by uh, this type of uh, outreach and communication uh, when it comes to the, these non-FEMA flood risks, how we want to deal with them. And what that means is that out of 19,000 permits that were issued by the city during that one year period, only 32 had any sort of interaction with one of these flood type areas. So it's not a big number, but it, it could be potentially important to those, uh, those permits and projects that are developing. And so what, is, what does it look like? What are we talking about when we talk about flooding that's outside the FEMA floodplain? Um, just like on that other, um, other uh, photo that I showed, if you've got a bunch of flooding and a bunch of water that. that's collecting in uh, residential um, areas this um, or in commercial areas, this is the kind of thing oh, that we're seeing. It, it is functionally um, very similar to a FEMA floodplain uh, by the way that the water accumulates. But if it's not on the map, then there's no way for, you know, uh, people or businesses to be aware of this kind of situation. So this is just some examples of, of flooding that we've seen across the city. Um, some other examples are here. Uh, these are you know, taken from uh, social media accounts that uh, we were made aware of, kind of showing you know, water flowing outside the stir crazy baked goods uh, offices. And then you can see how kind of the high water line on those vehicles that got you know, almost as high as the wheels there. And then other vehicles across the street there potentially getting flooded from those uh, that kind of runoff. And this is a, a video, uh, hopefully it will run here. This is the Paco's Mexican Cuisine on Magnolia Avenue. This is one of the areas that we have uh, mapped as a uh, potential flood area. And you can see this is, I mean, the whole street, Magnolia is a wide oh my street. God, phenomenal, just great. And uh, we've got basically curb to curb, full width of the street that's, you know, probably close to a foot deep. It's a, a significant amount of water. And uh, this is not the only location that we have something like this going on. Again, some other recent photos of uh, flooding in an area outside the FEMA floodplain. So again, um, the recommendations that we, we discussed with our stakeholder groups uh, were communication, regulation and uh, getting some maps out there. And uh, the mapping is, is tied to our communication. Um, we've got a number of new mapping products that are out there that we'll do a, a kind of a walkthrough on some of those here shortly. Um, on the regulatory side, again, these are only those uh, projects and locations that are uh, less than an acre in, in size. Um, we're already developing those locations that are over an acre and uh, those already have to show compliance with our drainage standards. And then uh, for these uh, projects that are going to be less than an acre, uh, there's a certificate of compliance to show that they're meeting uh, existing draining standards within our, our stormwater criteria manual. Uh, we're not looking at a rigorous engineering review at this time. Uh, an engineer will still be involved, but it's really just to, to make sure that the certificate of compliance is completed and they've uh, done all the work they need to do to show that they're not impacting other properties. And then uh, what, do these, what do these recommendations mean for the other property owners? Basically, uh, it helps them make informed decisions either before purchasing or before developing uh, so that they can be aware of the flood risk that's out there. Uh, last thing that we want is for some uh, smaller type project to really be impacted by flooding. Uh, we know that we see this from time to time where you know folks don't have a, an idea that there is a flood risk in these areas because they're not getting any kind of review that goes uh, with the, uh, the development as they come in for less than an acre. Um, so we want to make sure that all sizes of, of developments, you know, get some sort of uh, information that's related to flood risk in these areas and that they're uh, also complying with existing giant standards. And then finally, flood insurance is not required in any of these areas because they're outside the FEMA floodplains, but flood insurance is available to anyone in the city uh, that wants flood insurance or if they have a flood risk that they think is you know, more than they want to try to deal with and want to have that extra level of protection that flood insurance is available in these areas as well. So we'll now take a look at uh, kind of what the mapping uh, products that we have, and uh, we're going to start with our the, the FEMA floodplains. This is uh, kind of the old standard that we've had for years and years. Um, in this situation, it's 
colored blue, just so it shows up very well on our on our uh, GIS or our, our online mapping. Uh, the old FEMA maps used to be kind of a gray scale uh, when they were printed on paper, and then they've since gone to a more multicolored situation. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, uh, sake and being able to see kind of what's going on in the, in the area on these maps, uh, we're going to go with a blue color on these. Um, and this is essentially what what FEMA would call the 100-year or 1% flood. Um, this is the, the area, the blue areas are where flood insurance is going to be required if your property uh, or your development with a, a loan on it is within one of these zones. And so you can see that there's very limited uh, in this kind of, you know, university TCU, uh, Berry Street area. There's not a lot of uh, FEMA floodplain in there. There's, as you go towards Port Worth Zoo, there's a bunch of floodplain there. But uh, very narrow, thin floodplain over here by TCU on the left-hand side, and in the middle, there's there's really doesn't appear to be much going on. One of the one of the other projects we've got is this air, what we call potential high water areas, and this kind of is a it's a low level of detail, um, and we're not talking about regulating in this at all. It's all strictly advisory, but it it shows how the natural drainage patterns extend much further upstream than the FEMA floodplains are. And all this is, is it's a, it's a lower level of detail, but still a, a, uh, a useful hydraulic model that shows when rain falls on the terrain, um, we're, we're showing where the water collects and then continues to run downhill until it uh, creates a large enough drainage basin to be mapped by FEMA. And that's kind of one of the downsides of FEMA is they stop looking uh, basin is that are less than one square mile in size, but you can tell that there's obviously a lot more water still uh, running over land in these areas that are upstream of the one square mile limit. Um, we'll, we're going to have, uh, again, this is going to be shown on a, uh, a website that we have with our flood information located on it, and currently you can get notice of this type of flooding on the city's one address uh, application that I'll also show later. And then finally, the, the city flood risk areas are the orange here. Um, there's only about three square miles of this mapped in the city right now. It's an ongoing project. Uh, these are very detailed models that have all the pipe systems included in there. So it, you can see that the city flood risk area, the CFRAs, um, these, are the, these are the areas we're talking about regulating. Um, they have the pipe systems included. So there's, they're a little bit smaller in a number of locations. Uh, than the, the potential high water, that lower level of detail. So it's uh, going to be a much more refined look at what's going on, but it, it also generally pretty closely matches what the uh, potential high water, that lower level of detail shows. There is a lot of potential flow over the land uh, upstream of the FEMA floodplains because the storm drain systems uh, in these areas are just not able to handle the water. And again, this is kind of a, a zooming out a little bit further. Um, the FEMA floodplains are this 100 year or 1% chance per year type of a flood. It's a, it's a big rare event, um, but it's definitely, uh, you know, one of the, that's kind of the baseline flood event uh, that we work with and that other cities work with when it comes to dealing with flood risk. Um, again, flood insurance is required in the FEMA flood zones and the city has been a participant in the national flood insurance program since 1980. And uh, we do that so that flood insurance is available to anybody in the city of Fort Worth, and that requires certain types of uh, permitting for de new developments uh, within those flood zones. Um, again, these are, you know, the focus is on these areas that are one square mile or larger, so it doesn't have a lot of the refined uh, detail that uh, you might show where flood risk exists outside of those areas. And another assumption with, that FEMA had was that if it's in a, an urbanized area, then the drainage has been handled. And so that's not always been the case. Um, sometimes, you know, there's, there's situations where the, the pipes aren't big enough or there may not be any pipes at all. And those aren't going to be rec uh, shown on the FEMA floodplain maps. Uh, part of what we do, though, an additional thing is that uh, the city participates in this community rating system. Uh, and CRS is a, a program that we uh, basically show all the additional work that we do to help reduce and, and minimize flooding and uh, to get reduced flood insurance premium. So right now there's a 10% a discount on flood insurance for anybody in the city. And uh, starting in April, that'll go to 15% uh, because we've just recently recertified with some additional uh, credit than we had uh, prior to this. 
Again, the city flood risk areas, um, we have 16 detailed study areas that we've uh, looked at uh, generally within the loop. Um, they're not, not citywide at this point. Uh, these are, are very detailed and, and relatively expensive studies to do, so we have to really work them in as we get uh, new study areas identified for priorities and, and where we can uh, get the most bang for our buck paying for those studies. It's the same 1% chance flood risk as the FEMA floodplain, so we want to make sure that we're comparing apples and apples there. And again, we're focusing more on older parts of town that uh, don't have the, the more current uh, infrastructure installed and uh, haven't been designed to the same standards as we have today. And again, the, the goal here is to help. Uh, we want to be able to prioritize future capital projects um, and uh, understand what the flood risk in these areas, but uh, there's, again, not going to be a flood insurance requirement in these areas. None of these orange zones uh, would show up on the FEMA map at all. And so um, the, the flood insurance premiums in those areas should be lower. Um, that's going to be a, a question to take to an insurance agent. Uh, FEMA recently revised their uh, insurance uh, program so that uh, they look differently at the flooding than they used to. It's still only going to be the requirement to have the flood insurance within those those blue zones here for for this map. Then on the on the potential high water, this is the kind of that lower level of detail I mentioned. Um, again, you can see there's there's potential flood risk outside of the city flood risk areas that uh, that we have the detailed study for. And again, that's that's going to be a limitation of the information that we've got available. There's there's only so many areas that we've studied at this point with the, the real refined information, but the, the lower level of detail still provides a very useful look at what the natural drainage patterns are and uh, where water is flowing as it works its way downhill. And so the potential high water uh, product will be really useful for folks that uh, live outside of one of those city, flo city flood risk areas or the FEMA floodplains if they want to really understand what the natural drainage patterns look like and uh, kind of what their flood risk might be if they had any questions about that. So why do we have all these areas that are, are flood prone uh, that are not on the FEMA floodplain maps? Well, the, the main indicator for us is undersized or obsolete storm drain systems. And this map kind of shows that same kind of green neighborhood boundary that we looked at in the previous maps, uh, but with a little more detail related to the storm drain systems. And you can see that some of those storm drain systems were put in in the 1920s. Um, there have been areas that have been updated over time you know, from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, but there's, there's just a lot, of, uh, a lot of the storm drain system that was constructed early on when those areas were developed first uh, that's still in place. And that's going to be one of the ongoing uh, challenges for us as a utility is to uh, how to manage these, these older storm drain systems and get those things updated uh, as we can over time. And this is, uh, that's, that's really one of the things that we really want to understand how the flood risk is affecting these areas so that we can plan our, our capital program around those. And this, uh, I'll flash back a little quick, this lower storm drain system that has 1997 on the left and uh, 2020 or 1921 on the right, this is the, the plan set from that storm drain system right here. This is from the 1921 improvement project uh, where they went in and installed a new new pipe right down the street. It says Robert Street. That's, that street name has been changed. This is in the Ryan Place area. Um, and then you can see kind of that squiggly line that runs above the street there where it says Ravine. That's that's the old stream channel. Um, when these neighborhoods were laid out, there, was, there were frequently situations where there was an old stream channel that uh, ran uh, not exactly in line with the street systems out there. And sometimes that's where water still wants to go. And so that was a, an issue back then. It's, it's still an issue now that we're still trying to work with. And then on the other red box, you can see where they're replacing a 10-foot wooden inlet with a 10-foot concrete inlet. So even though this was an improvement project, they didn't improve the drainage. They just improved the materials in some situations to make them more durable. And uh, in some locations, we're still dealing with some of those same old pieces. So three ways to find this flood risk information and put it to use. Um, like we, again, I mentioned the one address, which is on the city's uh, main web page. Uh, you have to search for it there. I'll, I'll show you how to get to that here in just a little bit. Um, basically, that's a location where you can find any kind of information related to 
uh, your address and then what's going on around it. It's, it's got a location for building permits. It's got, you know, some crime statistics. It's got different council districts and trash pickup days, all kinds of things, including uh, if there's FEMA floodplain or uh, the potential high water areas in that location. Um, we also got the FEMA map service center where you can see the actual FEMA maps. If you have any questions about whether or not your, your property or project is affected by a, a FEMA floodplain, and then the new uh, Fort Worth Flood Risk Viewer that we'll take a look at here. On uh, the one address application, uh, we've got the, the web link up at the top there, oneaddress.fortworthtexas.gov. Um, when you put in your address, that's you'll get this kind of informa information right here in the reference section. Um, within 50 feet of a FEMA floodplain, um, that's because we have a, a buffer on all of our FEMA floodplains to, of 50 feet, so that people within that area will have an idea that those floodplains are nearby. And then uh, the little I button there will give you a pop-up state statement over here on the right that's talking about uh, the FEMA floodplains, you know, what they're based on, where they're located, where to get more information on those. And then also the potential high water with a similar little pop-up button for the mousing over the I. And, uh, Basically, it describes the, the type of flood risk product that we prepared and uh, generally talking about drainage patterns and uh, how to be mindful of those as you're uh, working in your, your area of interest and who you can contact for more information. This is a kind of a screenshot of the FEMA Map Service Center. Um, again, their, their web link is uh, relatively simple, msc.fema.gov, um, that will uh, take you to this location where you just pop in your address uh, right here and then uh, it will take you to the appropriate FEMA floodplain map that shows uh, what's going on at, at that specific location. It's not going to take you to the exact location um, but really close to it and it should have a pin to drop right on it. Um, just want to make sure that you're paying attention to exactly where it is. It's on the map there and uh, it'll give you a good, I good idea of what the FEMA floodplain maps look like nearby. And then again, our Flood Risk Viewer, which is a new mapping tool that we created. Um, it's available and live now. It's got a long link down here at the bottom, but uh, this uh, QR code over here on the left will also take you right there if you scan that with your phone. And uh, this is an example of the type of information we have there. There's the FEMA floodplains on the lower right, and then they tie into the city flood risk areas, the orange zone here on the left. And we'll be adding the potential high waters, those pink flood zones, uh, as soon as that information is available is being refined right now to be a little uh, smoother and more useful looking than uh, the pure model output that we had uh, up until now that I've shown you other, other maps. It, but when you zoom in on it, it looks a little, little ragged on the edges, but we'll have it smoothed out. And that should be done by the end of the year. And we'll upload that to this map uh, site as well. And on this map here, I've got the Hazel Harvey Peace Center uh, highlighted in kind of green. Um, this is where our, our in-person meeting will be on Wednesday, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the types of information that's out there and how close it is to some of these other city facilities that uh, we use on a regular basis. Um, we also provide uh, outreach to the community in areas that have uh, flood risk in them through uh, physical letters that we mail out every year. Um, this is one that went out September of this year. Um, if you're in a FEMA floodplain or in one of the city flood risk areas, uh, a letter very similar to this was, was sent to your address. And uh, if you're an owner or a renter of a property, um, you should be receiving a letter like this. Uh, we want to make sure that people that live there, if they don't own it, are aware of the flood risk. And if somebody has multiple properties that they're a uh, you know, property owner, we want to make sure that uh, they're able to see this flood risk information as well. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a flood. It just means that there's flood risk nearby or you're in one of these FEMA flood zones where there's a chance, you know, for a, a rare storm to, you know, cause some potential damage. We want to make sure that everybody's aware of this. And then uh, if, if available, there's different types of uh, resources that uh, could apply to, you know, mitigation of, of kind of damages or, or any kind of negative experience you have with flooding. Uh, there's a bunch of resources out there that we're trying to make folks aware of. Again, this is part of our uh, outreach that we do for flood risk areas as part of the community rating system, and that also all helps to 
uh, reduce flood insurance premiums for folks in the city. For next steps, uh, we want to, again, uh, get our potential high water areas uploaded to the websites by the end of the year. Um, that, that project or product is being refined right now. Um, we have regulations that are going to be uh, adopted by ordinance that we're targeting for the end of December uh, of 2022. And then uh, we'll start looking for those certificates of compliance starting in January of 2023. So these are all coming up fairly soon. And this is uh, really what we want to make folks aware of uh, as part of this meeting process. And so now uh, it's time for the demos. Let me see if I can stop sharing this and share what our demos look like. Okay, so this is our flood risk viewer. Again, this is uh, the Hazel Harvey Peace Center that we looked at earlier. Um, see if we can. We put in any address here. There's a, a, list, a list of tools across the top. Um, locate a, you know, an address here. If we want to do. 200 Texas Street, which is City Hall. It'll take you right there and it'll allow you to zoom in and out. And uh, they'll show you that there is uh, similar types of flood risk in downtown Fort Worth, um, some of it even going right by the current City Hall. And so this is a really simple um, tool to use. Uh, the, the locate address is going to be probably the, the main thing that you'll want to use with this. Got, if you don't know the exact address, you can put in cross streets. Um, you can pan around and zoom in, zoom out. And then uh, there's a whole bunch of identify tools that will let you look at different things as well. Let's see. There's street information. There's our city flood risk area. And it tells you the East Central Business District watershed, um, the type of storm it was, all of those things that are relative to that storm event. And again, if you zoom out a little further, you can see that it's the, the FEMA floodplains that run right through downtown or around downtown as well. Um, super useful stuff that uh, will be able to tell you exactly what's kind of going on in your area. Um, and again, um, we don't have city flood risk areas all over town. Uh, they're primarily within the loop. I'll zoom out a little bit here so you can kind of get a, a feel for where those areas are. And it looks like, again, it's generally up to you know, the 183, a little bit further north, and then a little bit further south. Um, a little bit, and then over here in the Meadowbrook area, there's there's some other study areas that we've got. So not there's not tons of them, but they're out there and, and useful if you uh, live in one of those areas. And for now, I think I'll close that one. Let me find our FEMA flood risk area, our FEMA flood plains. So again, there's the FEMA flood zones uh, can be found on the FEMA's flood uh, map service center. Um, again, just msc.fema.gov will take you here at your address. And you'll want to put a zip code in there because so, it's not specific. Claire, we can't work. see the we can't see the FEMA viewer. Nope. Was sharing. Dang it. Yeah, 
Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is the, the FEMA Map Service Center. Again, it's just msc.fema.gov. Um, it will add these terms on the end here. That's all you need to know. Then just like we showed on the little uh, screen capture, enter your address here. Be sure to include a zip code um, because the FEMA website is national. It's not built around Fort Worth like our flood risk viewers are. And then uh, it will take you to the appropriate map for that area. And that kind of gives you an overview of where you're at. And I think we're still waiting for some additional products to pop up. That's one thing the FEMA Map Service Center is not fast. Hmm. Yeah, it's still still thinking here. As well, it thinks it might be good just to mention Claire in terms of FEMA. The FEMA website always has the most accurate, up to date information on the mapping. Um, but then, of course, we try to put the FEMA information into our our Fort Worth flood risk viewer to make it easier for the public. But the the latest and greatest is always at FEMA, and that's because they're constantly updating their information, and so we can't update it as frequently on on our web map. So just kind of wanted to mention that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we update our FEMA data once or maybe t maybe twice a year, but FEMA, like like Jennifer just mentioned, that they update their maps constantly. It doesn't mean that every location changes constantly, but the, there will be changes across the maps all the time. And now that we've got all of our other information on this one, what this is showing is that the current city hall right here is right next to the, the a map panel edge. So there's one map up here on the north, and one map to the south. Uh, this is our approximate location. You can see the selected map boundary down here. Oops. And then all this other information that's related to different flood zones, uh, those kinds of things that are available, you can see those flood zones uh, over here on the left as the Trinity River goes through, and then different colors are different levels of flood risk. So the orange is going to be the, the 500 year, which is a FEMA product that uh, really they kind of focus on. We're more concerned with the, the 100 year, which is just kind of shaded blue and then the hatch color there. And you could also look into like a, a dynamic map, which has a little more detail for you to, to kind of zoom around in um, and, and kind of investigate what the flood risk in your area looks like on the FEMA perspective on that map. And again, it's also not very fast. I guess while we're waiting on that one, I can look up to the, the cities. There we go. So what this does is it gives you kind of the more detailed version uh, with all the same stuff that's in a kind of a printable form. Um, it's something that you can print out easily on 11 or eight and a half by 11 that shows what's going on there. But again, it doesn't doesn't have any of the, the city flood risk areas. FEMA doesn't care about that. Um, what they what they show here is that you're in this zone X, which is outside the floodplain as far as FEMA is concerned. Um, they don't acknowledge that this other information exists. So it's um, good to get the best insurance premium that way through FEMA, but it doesn't really re reflect the risk that's out there. And so from here, uh, I'll go to the, the city's one address. Oops. Go to. And again, we'll look at our city hall downtown. 
as soon as you start typing in the address, um, it will pick up uh, the, the available addresses that are that are valid for that that uh, information you've typed in so far, and then you, it'll base your search on that. So over here on the right gives you a, a map of the area. You can zoom in and zoom out. It really just gives you kind of a location of what's going on with different addresses that are associated with uh, those those areas that you typed in. And again, the location data, neighborhood profile, code violations, different permits, all that stuff is here. It's all really useful. Um, but when we, what we're talking about is the reference section right here that talks about um, is it within 50 feet of a floodplain? FEMA floodplain? No. Is it potential high water? No. Um, but we're going to, going to be adding in the city flood risk areas, which will uh, be a new line within here. That should be done by probably the end of the year as well. And uh, that'll be a little extra detail that you can get when you uh, go to the one address application to see uh, what's available out there. So all of these are pretty straightforward, easy to use. Um, some of them take a little time to load, so you want to make sure that you're being patient with them, particularly the FEMA stuff. Uh, all of the Fort Worth uh, applications are pretty quick, so it shouldn't be a real issue there. Um, but there's just a variety of information that's available to you. And one address is super useful for all kinds of things, not just the, the flood risk size, but um, all sorts of information that's useful for wherever you're at in the, in the city. And with that, let's get back to our presentation. So we've completed our demos. Um, we're now at the, at the point where we can start to take some questions and uh, see what uh, information has come into the chat. Uh, we'd be glad to, uh, to take that information, just make sure that, again, you're you're raising your hand, uh, clicking the button there so we can make sure that we're uh, seeing that you're um, asking a question. And then if you can also put uh, your questions into the chat so we can make uh, sure that we're getting the information that you're trying to convey to us there as well. Or this is Linda. We had one question earlier. I think uh, that gentleman may have left the meeting, but nonetheless, the question was about developer runoff. And while I believe the question was geared toward if, if there is currently a development that's causing runoff, I think that the presentation you've given also um, speaks to what the effort that we're doing here is going to do for future development. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, I think that would be helpful to everyone listening. Sure. So again, we when we've got this additional flood risk information for these non-FEMA flood risk areas, um, either the city flood risk areas with the more detailed or the, the less detailed uh, potential high water areas, um, all of that is going to be useful for someone who's going to be developing, you know, in an area where there's already development going on. Um, if there's you know, an existing neighborhood where, where there's going to be a new project that comes in, um, whoever is developing the new project has access to this information to see kind of where the natural drainage patterns are that they might not have had uh, in prior years before this information was developed. So um, there's, there's a bunch of work that we do as a city to try to help uh, ensure that uh, any new project that comes in isn't creating additional runoff that leaves the site in a way that causes harm to adjacent properties. Uh, but if those projects are smaller than an acre, they haven't been getting reviewed. So this will be a way for us to help close that gap um, and then look at those uh, those smaller projects that are you know, going to have water running off, you know, either more or, or than, than anticipated or or they wouldn't even know that uh, they're increasing runoff or has a drainage problem out there. So uh, this will help inform those developers and also help people that live nearby there understand kind of what's going on and what those drainage patterns look like. Um, once we start getting uh, those certificates of compliance in, uh, that'll be kind of the way that we're showing that those developments have uh, looked at adjacent uh, drainage conditions and have uh, met the requirements that we would have for uh, cities, the city's drainage 
drainage regulations and how it affects you know water leaving the site in a way that's supposed to match existing conditions, uh, not increasing runoff or or causing it to accumulate in a way that uh, would you know be some sort of a either a violation of the city's regulations or the state water code that essentially kind of prohibits con concentrating water and putting it onto an adjacent property in a way that causes harm. So, and just to touch on that a little bit differently is we get a lot of calls at the city from uh, developers or residents or property owners that are just often surprised it rains and then they realize, wow, there's flooding you know, in, the, in the area or their property. Um, and so that's really the whole purpose of this initiative is to make sure that people are aware because we at the city have this information. We're aware of the risk. We want our community to be as aware of the non FEMA flood risk as they are of the FEMA flood risk. So really just trying to ensure that everyone does understand their risks so they can take that into um, consideration when they go and they uh, make property improvements or develop their property and so forth. That's right. The, the bigger projects are going to have to already go through those type of types of uh, checks and balances, um, they're going to have engineers on staff that are going to really understand how to make all that work. And it's really these smaller ones that have kind of less flexibility in um, how they develop and where they develop and may not have the resources to really get um, as many engineers involved in their project as they would have as a larger project. So we want to make sure that all those folks are, you know, kind of have the same benefit uh, to receive uh, from this type of flood risk that's out there now. So as a bit of a follow up to that, Ms. Mary Kelleher is asking uh, Claire or Jennifer, why does the city continue to permit development when the city knows they don't have adequate infrastructure or money to fix it? Well, it's an interesting question. I think we need to, uh, there's been a lot of effort put in over the years uh, to try to design uh, storm drain systems for what they used to call fully developed conditions so that, you know, as, as areas were developed, um, there was, a, there's a way to anticipate how much runoff is, is leaving a site. Um, and all of our infrastructure as much as possible was try to, to design for those, those conditions when everything is fully built out. Um, I think the, the downside of, of that assumption was that there's a lot of parts of town that were uh, developed before those regulations were in place. So we're really trying to understand, uh, how these potential infill type developments can affect, you know, storm drain systems that are in these older neighborhoods and also look, you know, further downstream where there's, you know, maybe no storm drain system. Like I know that Mary lives on the, the east side of town. So there's a lot of large Trinity floodplain that's out that way, but also other streams that drain into that area. Um, you know, everything from upstream drains through there. So we want to make sure that we're being as mindful of potential impacts in that area as well. So to touch on that a little bit more to in, in a different way is is we do have um, we have very good drainage uh, regulations at the city of Fort Worth. Uh, they are based on generally accepted engineering practices and um, they a lot of them come from the um, North Central Texas Council of Governments, which is a, a group that kind of oversees and provides recommendations across the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, in terms of development and drainage and environment. Um, and so, so our standards are based off of a lot of their recommendations. Um, and we do understand that there are gaps in our standards and that's one thing that we are continuing uh, to work to address. And so this non-FEMA flood risk initiative was the very first initiative to really try to address the gap in our drainage standards in terms of um, the flood risk communication for non FEMA areas and then regulating those areas um, less than one acre uh, where we understand that flood risk in detail. So the second step now is that we're going to be taking a, a look at cumulatively the whole impact of development on flood risk and taking another look at our standards now in a different way to see if we should be updating them and how we can update them to better protect existing residents due to development um, and increases in impervious cover and so forth. Uh, so that is a, a second step uh, that we have identified that there is a need that we want to take a good look at our development regulations 
uh, because of course we do want to continue to grow and develop, but we want to do so in a safe and sustainable manner. I don't see any other um, hands raised or questions in the chat. So if there's anybody else in the group that has a question. Okay, uh, Mary, uh, go ahead. I am in the uh, Trinity Boulevard area and they're redoing all of our roads. Has there been a study done when they raise the roads 20 feet up where all that water's gonna go? And what wh was that thought about? Well, I'll, I'll take part of that. I know that there are engineering plans for uh, elevating the road up there because that, that road floods uh, kind of east and west of precinct line, that intersection. There's there's serious flooding problems on Trinity Boulevard. So the, the primary area that's getting elevated is west of precinct line. And so there have been looks at how that drainage is going to be managed uh, to get it from one side of the road to the other because it all generally drains to the south down towards the Trinity. And so they're they're going to have to manage water off of the road and then also passing water from north to south as it goes uh, down through that area. So when the road is elevated, uh, that's all going to be managed uh, by the current standards that are you know, for those, again, larger than one acre type projects. So it'll be a large capital project that's looking at just that kind of thing. And it's going to, you know, it'll handle the water that's, that's designed to, to handle it and not uh, create an impediment as you might be concerned with out there. I, I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but I know that I've spoken with other folks that have concerns with water getting backed up out that way. Yeah, I'm worried about it backing up into my house. <laughs> I'm on the north side, so that's good that it should drain south, but you know, you never know. <laughs> right, and there's a there's a lot of there's that big pond that's to the to the west there. Um, that's kind of a, it functions somewhat as a detention area because uh, it's you know it has a big series of pipes that are going to be installed under the under the new roadway uh, that will carry more water than is in there now. Um, there's just tiny old pipes that are in part of the basically a county road type section that's out there. It's not it wasn't ever designed to carry all the water that could come to it, um, but it's going to be upsized to manage that much better in the future. Thank you. And if you have specific questions about like your specific property and you know potential project impacts, you can feel free to email us, and we'll we can put um, an email in the chat at floodplain at fortworthtexas.gov and we're happy to kind of talk to you about your specific area in more detail if you'd like. Thank you. And so um, Haley has a question. I'm assuming Haley Sampson, um, who we've been communicating with, is asking the question, um, is there a timeline for how the city plans to study cumulative impact of development? And Haley, I know that we've um, gone back and forth and we thank you for participating in this meeting to learn more. And um, it is the thing that we'll be doing next. Uh, we've been working on it, but we've been working intensely on this project. So I'm gonna let Jennifer and Claire kind of answer your time frame question. That's a great question. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, the cumulative impact is a is a new uh, initiative that we're we're really kicking off now. We completed a couple of case studies uh, to basically verify the impacts that uh, the increased impervious cover and loss of, of flood storage uh, along natural streams. We felt like there were potential impacts from that. We had these case studies uh, completed to to put numbers to. Uh, the types and, and level of potential impact on those two case study areas. So we're going to be expanding uh, how we uh, deal with those types of impacts by uh, basically creating another stakeholder group to uh, consider how we can deal with those types of situations citywide in the future. It's not going to be a cookie cutter you know, solution that's one, one, one solution fits all parts of town. We're going to have to look kind of more uh, in detail at different parts of town that can respond in different ways, but the stakeholders are going to be the ones that help inform us how to do that. And so that'll be starting uh, by the first part of the year, January timeframe, 
we're looking at um, having the stakeholder group uh, starting to really participate and uh, work with uh, our city staff members to really understand how we can uh, deal with increases in impervious cover. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, do we want to have like on-site detention for these areas or do we want to prohibit an increased impervious cover? There's going to be a wide range of things that we look at that are potential solutions for those types of things. And then also looking at the lost flood storage for basically filling in floodplains uh, in different parts of town. So we want to understand both of those and that stakeholder group will be uh, starting to function in the January timeframe. And we hope to be uh, hopefully bringing back some sort of results that we can take to the council as recommendations for uh, either engineering standard or zoning uh, classification type uh, revisions by probably the middle of the year. Haley, did that answer your question well enough? I know we're going to be talking with you afterwards. Um, let us know if not. Other, otherwise, um, Don Dean is asking the question, why is water quality protection within runoff encouraged, quote, but not mandatory in the city of Fort Worth? Well, I guess uh, I've got maybe part of the answer to that. I think Jennifer probably has some more details, but we, we really look at stormwater quality um, in two different departments with the environmental department taking the lead on really looking in the details of water quality where we are more looking at um, how to improve water quality without necessarily quantifying it so much um, we, we look at ways to deal with water quality from a, a construction perspective and you know how can we have lower impacts um, from development like uh, and the green infrastructure that you guys might have heard about uh, ways to deal with water quality that kind of collects trash and, and sediment before it enters the storm drain system. Um, our, our environmental folks really look more at the, the water that's in the system itself as it reaches into the other uh, water bodies of the city. And I don't know if you got anything else to add to that, Jennifer, but uh, we've both been in those conversations with uh, environmental about this topic. Right, so I will mention, um, to my understanding, when the stormwater utility was started in 2006, uh, which I wasn't here in 2006, uh, but when it was, and we put together the development regulations uh, that we have today, which have been updated since 2006, that there was discussion about um, requiring water quality, um, uh, water quality measures for all developments. And I guess at that point in time, it was decided um, that it would be encouraged, but it would not be mandatory. And so at this time, we don't have the mandatory requirements for final developments. Um, of course, for developments that are in progress, they do have to have uh, best management practices to um, control the um, the runoff with in terms of the erosion um, or the sediment sedimentations. Um, you know, putting those inlet protectors and so forth, um, trying to uh, prevent the uh, the runoff and the erosion, the the sediment from leaving their site during construction practices. So we do have those for construction. Um, and then in addition, specifically, the Tarrant Regional Water District has specific water quality requirements um, right along the Trinity River for developments that are outfalling pretty much directly into the Trinity River. But those are, are specifically for the water district, their requirements. So, Don, did that answer your question about specifically the construction runoff perspective? So I'm looking at I'm looking at her follow up. It says I'm talking about from a construction runoff um, perspective, and so so we do have construction water quality best management practices that are required during the construction process. And we can we can call and and talk to you. I I know um, Miss Dean that Steven's been talking with y'all, and so we can follow up if you have more specific questions about our current regulations. And then um, we have another question in the chat from Ms. Mary Kelleher, which is, why doesn't the city consider slowing down development until you have the infrastructure to support it? So to me, I, th I would say that goes back into, we've got, we've got good development um, criteria. And we, right now at this time, I, I'm, I'm kind of scrolling back up in that chat too, and I see that there's one, will the city start taking volume into consideration? 
now that the city knows it's a problem by not taking it into consideration. And so, so right now we can't, we don't have the regulatory means to make uh, developers do something different about volume. We have to have that um, pass through city council to require that. But we do know uh, based of our recent cumulative impacts evaluation that there can be impacts. And that's why we're forming the stakeholder group that Claire discussed uh, a few minutes ago, because we want to take a detailed look at the issues and what could be done to mitigate those through through development regulations. And if we come up with the changes, those would have to go to city council for approval. Are there any further questions? I'm not seeing any more in the chat or anybody else with their hand up. Um, Leon, no questions here, just a thanks for the meeting. Mary says that didn't really answer her question though. Um, sorry, I missed <coughs> one here. Well, let me go back. John Dean um, is asking, um, Sorry, Don, I missed that. I was scrolling through trying to get everybody in as well. Um, so she says, but don't, don't you regulate. regulate. Yeah. That no, sorry, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, uh, Don Dean is asking, but don't you regulate and enforce TCEQ regulations? And so, so I would say that we do. We do have regulations during the construction process. Um, and those are uh, governed and enforced by our code compliance department and stormwater works closely with code compliance um, if there are issues and we go out and we work of course with the developers because our first thing is we want them to fix the issue um, and bring it into compliance. So we try to work very closely so they bring those issues into compliance as quickly as possible. And Stephen added some additional detail in the chat about that. Oh. So it says, uh, so Stephen says the construction runoff quality and TCE coop items fall under the stormwater pollution prevention plan and code compliance department. <clears throat> so that's a good point about the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Yeah. I guess if you see problems with, with, you know, some BMPs not functioning, like if the, the silt fence is down or if the you know, there's a bunch of sediment getting washed out into the street. That's all something that you can call code enforcement about, and they'll come check it out pretty quickly. So I know that they, they're very active about getting out in the field to try to understand those uh, problems and get them rectified as soon as possible. And, and so, Don, in terms of your comment here about you cannot make a developer, or I said you can't make a developer comply. So I wasn't saying with regard to the stormwater pollution prevention plan. So our our specific requirements, we can require developers to comply with them. I was talking about the whole cumulative impacts of development in terms of uh, the volume of stormwater runoff from development. So right now, if we don't have regulations that control um, how the volume is, or can control the amount of volume runoff, we can't require developers um, to do anything different than our regulations, but we do have regulations regarding um, construction best management practices that are in the stormwater pollution prevention plan, as Stephen mentioned. And Mary has added a follow up comment in the chat. Jennifer, you're probably best suited to answer that. <clears throat> So yes, so Ms. Keller says we've been seeing problems since 2018 with no response from the city until a recent hire of Heather Berryman. So, um, so yeah, as mentioned, we do work closely uh, with Code Environmental and, and Heather is in the Code Department. So Stormwater does work closely with her um, on any issues that arise.
Any other questions or any other questions in the chat from anybody? I just wanted to, um, again, point out that the meeting's being recorded and we'll be posting the meeting on our webpage for this topic. I did post that earlier, but let me go ahead and copy and paste it again where you can find that webpage. Um, all of the links that Claire did a demo of are also on that page. And um, there's additional information on that page as well. So, so I wanted to uh, to follow up on Mary comment here. Can y'all recommend slowing down development? Um, so, so the council members are aware um, of the the gap in our regulations, and that we are going to be looking into the cumulative impacts. Um, topic in more detail. We did have a recent presentation to our mobility infrastructure and transportation committee, um, as well as an informal report about uh, about this and that we would be looking into it. Additionally, we're meeting uh, with all the council members. We meet with them every fall and we talk about a wide range of topics, uh, stormwater included. Um, and we're mentioning uh, the cumulative impacts of development findings and the upcoming stakeholder meetings in those meetings as well. Um, so ultimately it's up to city council, uh, whether or not they want to slow down development, but we have made an effort to, to make them very aware of the issue and the importance um, that we are looking at our development regulations because of this. Um, and we can get you a copy of the report. Uh, I have your email, so we'll get it sent to you. As well as the uh, informal report that we gave to council, which is a much easier read. <clears throat> okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Well, I'll stop sharing and That's okay. all we've got then. Great. Well, thank you all. Good night. Thank you so much, Claire, for presenting. Yep. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you.